much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here in my home state. Uh, and congratulations to Sri Vijay Raghavan for um, putting this program together, but more broadly for initiating Cater and on this uh, second anniversary. Uh, it's been a fantastic thing for us to come here and observe how far he's taken the program and how unique um, uh, center it is. And I think it's going to be a role model in the future uh, all across this country. Uh, so congratulations. So today I'm going to talk about um, social communication deficits and the brain circuits that underlie that. And so you heard from Kathy this morning that social communication deficits are a hallmark of autism spectrum disorders. And you've seen in DSM-5 criteria now that's uh, obviously a center stage uh, phenotypic feature. And so what are the brain mechanisms that underlie social communication deficits? And our work, which I'm going to summarize today, uh, is really focused on the reward and salience uh, detection circuits. And I'll describe these as I go along. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues here who have contributed to this work. They include uh, biomedical engineers, clinical psychologists, um, and cognitive neuroscientists all working together uh, with funding mainly from uh, NIH, the National, U.S. National Institutes of Health. So I want to uh, start by opening with some broad general questions uh, that we want to address and this work is a part of. Um, and those relate to how is the brain of a child uh, with autism different from typically developing children? Which brain circuits are aberrant and how do they relate to different types of uh, behaviors and clinical symptoms uh, that we see in, in the clinic or uh, behaviorally? Can we develop brain-based biomarkers that will allow us to predict clinical uh, symptoms and outcomes? So can you take uh, measures from the brain and say who is going to develop uh, normal language skills or normal uh, social skills? And what is the underlying neurophysiology of this? Can we relate this back to basic neuroscience and with very deep perturbation from animal models to kind of relate clinical work, to human neuroscience work, and then to mouse models typically uh, that have been, uh, become so popular and, and, and critical uh, to the study of autism uh, phenotypic features. And then can we use these, uh, what we've learned here, to inform uh, treatment, to identify subtypes and tailor treatments? So those are the broad general questions, and I'm going to focus this talk on a particular a feature that uh, Kathy already alluded to, uh, which you saw in some of the videos, a lack of interest in social interaction is a hallmark of autism. The inability to initiate uh, communication or to respond to social cues, uh, in particular vocal cues. And what I want to summarize today are two lines of evidence from our work which have focused on the reward uh, pathway in the brain. And this is a model that has been building up over the years from preclinical uh, pre rodent studies, studies in rats, but we can then take those key features and say, are those expressed similarly in the human brain? Is there something in the reward circuit that might contribute to social deficits and the inability to initiate social interaction? Because it does need an intrinsic motivation, which we all take for granted, but it does need an intrinsic motivation to engage in social behavior. Uh, and the second line of work relates, um, again, to this core aspect of social communication, the ability to respond to the human voice and to then uh, to be able to uh, communicate with it and engage uh, in, in an engaged manner, not just yes or no and monosyllabic responses, but continuous uh, social communication. So how, how do we probe these? And so, uh, but the, at the center of all this work, we need theories. You know, what, what is the underlying model for how we're thinking about social communication deficits? And so one of the prominent theories that has emerged in recent years is the social motivation theory of autism. So individuals with autism find social interaction less rewarding, as I mentioned. They have reduced interest, which then results in cascading effects on social skills acquisition, because if you don't respond to uh, initial social interactions as a child, your learning in all kinds of domains, cognitive, academic, is going to be limited. 
And so this idea has been gaining more traction in, in the literature, and this really nice review by Gabrielle Dichter and JAMA Psychiatry is worth reading. Um, and the, the question then is, uh, are the deficits in uh, the reward circuits and are they reflective of social communication deficits at the individual level? So I want to orient you a little bit for those who are not familiar with uh, brain um, science. What we're looking at is a map now more than 100 years old from the great uh, German neurologist um, uh, Brodmann. And it shows some of the areas that are on the surface of the brain, on the lateral side, and the number of structures which are involved uh, in processing social cues, but also a number of areas that are buried deep in that you can only probe with techniques like MRI and functional MRI. And in particular, uh, this is a part here, if you can get this, I think the screen is probably too bright to show, uh, but the areas that are close to 42 and 21 that are labeled there, they are very selective for the human voice, which I'll emphasize in the latter part of my talk. Now, one of the metaphors that has emerged in uh, recent years for thinking about brain function is a network analogy. That is, the brain consists of multiple nodes that are communicating with each other, and there are hubs, like the red dots that you see, and those, uh, each of those dots reflects one part of the brain that's talking to different parts. So hubs in red, if they are disrupted, you'd see major uh, disruptions to human uh, behavior. Uh, the ones which are in black, they impact more locally, and they may not have such severe consequences. So that's one idea that's kind of emerging in the field, and those are ideas that we've actually brought to the field now to try and understand the uh, autism brain better. And here underlying um, are two key concepts, which I want to also uh, illustrate to you, because they're part of how we uh, build uh, models for what happens to the brain. And it relates to each of those individual areas that I showed you. They could have dysfunction in a particular disorder. For example, in autism, there are about 10 or 15 parts of the brain that are impacted. Now, if they happen to be hubs, like I showed you earlier, they are going to impact communication across a number of different um, parts of the brain, and thereby affect uh, much more complex types of functioning, you know, compared to, for example, motor deficits, which might be much more localized to uh, a narrow set of um, brain areas. So um, this is the technology we use. It's a, a standard MRI, pre-Tesla MRI scanner, things that you see around any uh, modern city these days all around the world. and. Um, and it, the pulse sequence has been uh, tailored to acquire brain images now every almost half a second. And here's a child who's been through the scanner, and he's come out pretty pleased with the image of his brain in his hand, which uh, children really love. Uh, and so we've actually scanned now more than 1,000 children over the years. Uh, can I get the uh, video here? So this is somebody just lying quietly in the scanner, and you just said, don't think about anything in, uh, specifically. Can you turn the video on here? Uh, and you'll see that the brain is still active during what we call the resting state, so no explicit task that's given. I've not asked you to solve a math problem, for example. Uh, and different parts of the brain are active, and they uh, come on and off over time. I think uh, that's not playing, so I'm going to, yeah, you can see that there. If you could just play that. Um, can you turn that on? Can you see that now? So this is a very dynamic system, and it's always active. Different parts come on and off at different times. Uh, and this is uh, the system on which we have to try and understand what is the nature of the aberrant circuitry. So it's not just sitting there quietly. Uh, and so the way we think and model brains and the way we understand these circuits are all constrained by the fact that this is a very uh, rapidly changing dynamical system. So uh, here's just a cartoon showing that, you know, one of the ways we study brain circuits using this technology is to see how different parts of the brain are linked, how are they talking to each other. So you can think about this as uh, air traffic from a sit one city to the other. How is communication happening? And this communication is happening on a structural network. You can think about this as a roadway, for example. These are actual structural pathways. On top of that, you have traffic. and we call that structural and functional connectivity, the actual physical links and the traffic that flows through them. 
And those are the tools that we use to study um, brain disorganization in children with autism. So one of the, I was telling you about the preclinical studies. So these are studies where you can actually take a rat and you can manipulate in very great detail specific circuits. You can actually, unlike the human brain, you can open it up and you can probe with electrodes, you can stimulate. And just very briefly, I want to tell you that this has kind of become an interesting model for thinking about the reward circuitry. And this basically shows that, um, if this shows up, it doesn't. But um, if you stimulate particular parts of this reward pathway, which are labeled here as NAC and VTA, you can get um, enhanced social behavior or you can get suppression of um, a diminution of social behavior. So you, you can manipulate social behavior by simply changing the activity of this reward circuit. It's called a uh, dopaminergic reward circuit. It's actually, you heard music today, it's engaged by all kinds of rewards, explicit money rewards, but also implicit rewards like music and also social communication. So the idea is that social communication is inherently rewarding, it engages the system, and perhaps this circuit is uh, aberrant in children with autism. So that's kind of what we sought out to test. Uh, and the study was led by Kostov Sapeker in my lab. And so what we did was to take uh, the structural brain data that I showed you with the structural wiring, uh, and we mapped out the structural links between these two areas that link the reward core reward pathway. And so I'll just take you through the, the results very briefly. Um, the, uh, this is the study participants. We had a replication cohort. And you know, ideally, we'd like to study children who are two and three years old so we can track them. But some of these things are not there yet. And one of the things, obviously, we want to establish is that there are deficits at the age of seven to nine when we can actually probe them. Uh, not just using structural measurements, but also when they do a task in the, in, while their brain is being imaged. So, um, so this is kind of just the technology of it. You uh, identify two uh, areas here, the NAC and VTA that I've shown, and then you track fibers that it's just like a circuit that you have to map across the whole brain. And then you identify uh, in, the f in the fifth panel there uh, the track that links uh, the uh, ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens, the NAC and VTA, and that's a critical path for reward processing. And this, um, you can actually see even without um, statistical analysis of the data, TD is typically developing. These are the, de the dense fibers that link these areas. Uh, ASD is the autism spectrum disorders. Visually, you can see that the tracks are much weaker, and that's what we found in two different cohorts uh, of data that we acquired. The strength of the connection on this track is actually weak. Uh, we replicate this uh, in the second cohort, and this is a study that we published uh, last year. And, and you can see also critically, um, is there a relationship between the structural integrity of this pathway and clinical symptoms? And it turns out that the weaker the structural pathway, uh, the str more severe the social uh, interaction deficits. And this was also replicated in the second cohort. And now we ask the uh, subjects to, while well, they're lying in the scanner, to do a task. They're simply passively viewing uh, social and non-social stimuli. The social stimuli are faces, and the non-social are these scenes. And we can see how much signal is flowing between these two areas. And um, in, so that's a functional coupling, like the traffic flowing from area A to B. And here also we see a deficit in signaling uh, along this reward pathway. And furthermore, the strength of this functional connectivity, this is functional, not structural, what I showed you earlier, and that also is related to the severity of social deficits. So now we have two uh, pieces of evidence that this circuit is dysfunctional in children with autism. Uh, and then the, the next task is to ask if you have the child process certain kinds of information, would you see um, deficits? So this is just how it is intrinsically. So to summarize this part of the talk, uh, the first piece of evidence that I was mentioning, this uh, reward circuit is uh, aberrant in children with autism, and it's, we are able to reproduce this result. Uh, it's related to uh, social interaction impairments as assessed using the ADIR. Um, 
And so this is giving us a sign that you know that there is there's an impairment in how reward uh, is uh, how this reward circuit is functioning. So it's very well and fine to establish the circuit. Now we want to see. Uh, in, the, in a much more pragmatic sense, how is the brain of a child reacting to uh, a key aspect of social communication, which is the human voice. And this, of course, is a deficit that has been noted in the very early stages of uh, autism research and identified by uh, Leo Kanner in the, you know, 1943 here. Uh, and so the idea is that the child with autism typically does not respond to uh, her mother's, his or her mother's voice, it does not register a change in emotion. In some sense, uh, the sound doesn't exist. And so, uh, it, and this has been in the uh, popular literature as well. Uh, here's uh, just a cartoon illustrating uh, the mother calling out to the child uh, multiple times, and the child is simply engrossed in um, his or her area of, of interest at that point. And so, um, so what we did in a series of studies, which I want to take you through, um, is um, to look at the brains of uh, children with autism and they are processing the human voice. And we are particularly interested in that green area, which is uh, an area we call the voice selective cortex. It specifically responds to the human voice when you control for all other stimuli. And so the idea is, is this a hotspot of deficit, initial hotspot of deficit for, for children with autism? Maybe it doesn't respond sufficiently. And then the question is whether its links to the reward circuit are impaired and they predict um, social uh, communication deficits. So this is just briefly to, as a theoretical point, not so relevant here. Most of the studies of voice proce processing are focused on the you know, phonemic and the structural aspects. Sometimes when we don't really focus on clinical disorders, we don't pay so much attention to the fact that the voice is really fundamentally an instrument of social communication. And uh, some of these theoretical viewpoints can actually miss that. So um, here, um, what we did was to just even um, start by looking at, uh, at this intrinsically in terms of the connection pattern of the voice selective cortex. How connected is that, uh, that green spot there you see at the top to the rest of the brain? And in uh, typically developing children and children with autism. And so what this study shows is that this um, same reward pathways, and in fact an extended system, is weaker in children with autism. So the voice selective cortex is weakly connected in children with autism. Uh, and this is just replication with the right hemisphere. Um, and then we can actually use the signal, um, the, uh, the strength of the signal connections to predict um, clinical symptoms. So uh, there's a whole set of links related to um, arising from the voice selective cortex to the rest of the brain, in particular those involved in emotion and reward processing. So we've now, so you know when you come to uh, study autism or any neurological disorder, you can actually go the other way. You could say, what is this disorder telling me about how the normal brain processes information? And so we've actually proposed this model that we have to go beyond these structural aspects to really think about the, uh, the emotive and the reward value um, that's intrinsic to the human voice, and that's at the center of social communication. So I'm uh, switching gears. So this is the part that's focused on functional tasks. Um, so the child comes and lies in the scanner, and they hear voices. And we want to know how responsive the, uh, the brains of, uh, of children with autism are to the human voice. As so we here we use, I don't have the time to play the sounds, they're actually nonsense words because we want to take all semantic content out of it. So look at just the most elemental aspects of human voice processing. And we had a very interesting design which is focused on the biological saliency of the voice. So the primary caregiver for any child is, obvious, is in most cases the mother. And so we designed a study where the child listens to the mother's voice and another matched um, unfamiliar voice. 
And the question was, is there something selective about the mother's voice for the, for the typically developing child and for the child with autism? So those are, hear them, uh, but it just basically says T body Schult, which is uh, a very canonical speech, uh, multisyllabic uh, word, um, which uh, nobody really understands what it means, which is a great thing for us. So here we are looking at um, activation. So you can see when the mother's voice is being heard versus other voices. So the voice acoustically is exactly the same. The only difference is that the stimulus now has a biological salience to you, because your mother's voice is more salient than a random other woman's voice, right? And that's what we found here in this study. That is, you have these reward processing areas, uh, which I won't go into the detail of, but and the voice selective cortex, which is differentially activated. It's more active and you're listening to your mother's voice than some other voice. So this isn't a child. And we're actually st I'm trying to study this developmentally now. It's very exciting. Um, and this is just a profile that is looking at the connectivity again, but in a task context. How is the connection changing with task? And that is also related to social communication. So the less strongly connected, uh, the more the deficits. Um, the larger numbers are on the lower side of the graph. So again, it turns out to be the reward and the uh, affective system, the emotion processing system. Uh, and this is just basically saying the same thing with the right on the right side, which is less voice selective, but is involved in processing uh, prosody or uh, affective content. And pitch contour is related to emotion. So, you know, behaviorally, the children with autism are not that impaired. Maybe have them come outside the scanner and they do a, a detection task. Is, they, is this a mother's voice or some other voice? They can mostly do it right. And we match these stimuli acoustically. And it, it's, uh, so it's something, you know, very specific to the biological saliency of this voice. And now we can actually take uh, uh, these data and um, look at... Uh, children with autism and map their deficits. Again, these deficits show up in these reward processing areas that I showed. And again, you see connectivity deficits related to the how the voice cortex connects to the reward circuit. And this is a study that we just published um, last, uh, a few months back actually, again, showing this uh, reward pathway uh, and a system that we call the salience network, which I didn't have a lot of time to go through, given the limitations of time. Uh, but feel free to ask me later. Uh, and we see deficits in the processing in these systems that I mentioned. It's a, it's a very consistent pattern. We see intrinsic structural deficits, intrinsic functional deficits. So the circuit is, is weak. Uh, and the way it processes information is weak. And the degree of processing of this information and the connection is related to social um, deficits. So um, we have a lot of converging evidence and then we can do something called network analysis to bring all this together. And these circuit features are jointly predictive of clinical symptoms. And this is predictive um, in a, what's called a leave one out. You can take data from uh, 30 subjects that can predict the uh, deficits in the 31st subject. And so that's the predictive modeling, and that's where some of these brain imaging tools are really very powerful. And just very, uh, you know, finally, very briefly, uh, this is a study that we uh, are working on now uh, in which we uh, played um, a happy, you know, we're looking at emotion processing, um, and the voice carries uh, a lot of emotion. Um, and uh, we had happy and sad, fa uh, sad voices, um, and looking at emotional reactivity and decoding of emotions, which is necessary to maintain communication. Uh, and a bag, here, a bag oh. is in the room. Ah, you can hear some of that. Uh, we can catch up with the stimuli later, just let, to let you know that this is actually designed very carefully. Uh, all the controls matched, as a we typically do. And, but the result that, you know, the brain result that I want to leave you with is that we can use something called a decoding technique. It's a machine learning uh, tool. Uh, we, we can see how the patterns related to happy and sad uh, 
uh, are differentiated between themselves, or for happy uh, voices, whether they're typically developing and their autism children process the information similarly. And again, this points to the reward pathway in the nucleus accumbens uh, and the amygdala. So both the reward and emotion processing circuits are impaired in relation to uh, extracting uh, emotional information from the voice stimulus. All roads lead to Rome. That's, that's kind of what it's pointing at. Uh, and so a brief summary of, of these uh, results. Um, so we see a weaker brain circuit for voice processing, um, a striking pattern of weak connections in the voice, how the voice uh, selective cortex is connected to the reward um, circuit. And the underconnectivity actually predicts individual differences in um, social communication. And those, this then becomes a biomarker that we can use um, to probe um, uh, progress over time. And, and this is a good neural target for looking at efficacy of, uh, of interventions, we feel, um, because uh, the, the voice processing is the core of uh, how social communication skills have to be built. Um, so, just kind of very briefly, I want to try and relate this back to um, the other core symptom of autism. And this is in the context of a broader theory of psychopathology that I've proposed. Uh, and the general idea is that um, if, a, if stimuli from the external world, the idea is very simple. Uh, this is just a circuit mapping of it. If stimuli from the external world are not rewarding and they don't engage you, then your brain stays in an, its own internal states. And, I've, uh, and I think one of the thing, ways it manifests itself in ch uh, children with autism is through the restricted repetitive behaviors. So in a very um, interesting theoretical way, there is a link between what you attend to in the external world and how you respond to it and how you engage yourself internally. And so that's, that's a different theory, but I just wanted to mention that in the context of the other DSM core criteria of autism, which is um, basically uh, restricted repetitive behaviors. Uh, and there's a cognitive component to it, and there's a motoric component to it, but uh, this really pertains to the cognitive aspects. So um, I just want to conclude here. Uh, so what I've done is provided two converging line of evidence um, that uh, there is an impairment in the voice, in the reward circuitry. There is an impairment in the way the um, reward circuit and the reward pathways are linked to the voice selective cortex. And together they contribute to voice um, and social information processing deficits. Um, and, um, and I think this is giving us some insights into the underlying neurobiology. It's also linking us to the rodent model. So the ideas we developed from basic neuroscience now have some anchoring in human neuroscience work. And it helps us understand, I think it provides um, a foundation for the social, understanding how the social motivation theory might play out. The, the reason why a child with autism might not be interested in attending to the external world. Uh, and that has a, is a deficit in this core reward circuit. So that's what I have. Thank you.